It's a lot of work trying to keep up with what's happening in your code repos, let alone what to focus on. Here is where AI can come in handy. Okay, personally, I don't think that AI is a great tool for doing your job for you, but it can give you a really good base to work off of. For those who don't know, GitHub has a CLI that allows you to see any of your GitHub related activity for a certain repo through your terminal. I use it quite heavily in my workflow. I actually can't remember the last time that I created a pull request through the web interface instead of just using GHPR create. Dolev, an OG Charm community member, even created an entire dashboard with the GitHub CLI to view all of your activity in GitHub right from your terminal. Okay, we can access our GitHub issues from our terminal and we have an AI chatbot that also uses a CLI. Why not just write a little script that can summarize the key trends that are happening in issues, therefore help you figure out where you need to target your attention. Better yet, let's get those summaries sent via email so that you've got a record on there and it is timestamped and you now have to stay accountable to your responsibilities, okay? Whether you like it or not. For this thing to work, you got a few things you gotta install, okay? You gotta have pop which is being able to send emails from your terminal. You also need mods, which is the AI chatbot that is scriptable. And both of these things also require environment variables to be set. You can either add these environment variables to your script or your RC files. So whether that's bash RC, ZSHRC, or whatever other shell you, that you use. And then if you're wanting to access it from your existing terminal session, you can just source that RC file or just start up a new terminal session and you'll be good to go. Because I keep my dot files public, I like using Skate to protect my API keys, to protect me from myself, mostly. So I'll include an example here of what the comparison looks like between defining the environment variables normally or using Skate to obscure that sensitive information. Skate is end-to-end -end encrypted, gets encrypted on your machine, so in case you're worried about that. Some of you might not have heard of mods or pop, so let me explain that real quick before we get into the actual meat of the script, all right? Mods is a command line interface for interacting with AI chatbots. So you can tie it in with any open AI compatible endpoint or even local AI models. So you can use your own self-hosted models. It does use GPT-4 by default, but also has some ports that it expects by default, which is 8080 for your local model to run on. You can, I don't know, read more about that in the description if you're curious. POP is a terminal-based program that allows you to send emails either with command line or a TUI, so right from your terminal. You can either have the option to send through resend or with a custom SMTP setup. In either case, you're gonna have to set some environment variables. So I will attach a link to the blog post that has all these details written out in case you prefer to follow written format, but I'll also put them on the screen here so that you can see what's up. All right, so now we can actually put it all together. Step one is that you need to set up your OpenAI API key environment variable. Step two is that you have whatever environment variables you want for pop setup, whether that's resend or your custom SMTP server setup. And then we're gonna run this script. So what's happening in the script is, as you can see, I am defining the API keys in the script itself because they're always gonna need those environment variables. And then I'm checking that they've provided an argument. The argument is gonna be the path to whatever repo it is that you wanna get information from. And then if you have provided a path to a repository, we're going to go to that repo, we are going to retrieve all the issues and then sort them by bug reports and enhancements. And then we are going to send it via email with pop. And you know, because it's always fun to layer on the complexity like a cake or dip, whatever's layered, like an onion, why not layer on the complexity of what if we wanted to schedule this thing to happen on a regular basis? And how we do that is with cron. Now, as soon as I mentioned cron, I had some people say system D timer is what you should be using. That's what all the, the giga chads are using on the internet nowadays. So you're actually behind on the times bunny. And I said, wow, that's tragic. But anyway, I'm gonna teach you about cron jobs because they are the more popular solution and more widely accepted, okay? System D might be better in some ways, but for those who don't know what cron is, cron is a daemon that is used to execute scheduled commands, mainly on Unix systems. It comes pre-installed on most Unix systems, 
I think. Okay, am I spreading misinformation? I don't know if it still comes pre-installed. It always comes pre-installed with my Linux distros. So should come pre-installed. And if you're a Windows user, you can also use WSL, which is the Windows subsystem for Linux. Another option if you're on Windows is that you can use Windows Task Scheduler to automate your tasks, but I'm not gonna get into that here, okay? To configure this thing, you use cron tabs, which are files that have all the information on what you need to execute. So it will have the interval of when this script will run. It has a path to the script. It has potential logging information in there. Cron jobs don't execute in your regular shell. While before it might've been okay to set your environment variables in your RC files, your cron jobs won't have access to that. So if there are any environment variables that you need to pass forward, you do that in your cron tab file. In my case, I'm depending on my go path because that's where the binaries for pop and mods are installed because I used go to install them. I had to add my path and I had to add go path to carry those environment variables forward into the cron tab. This is part of where I found it helpful to define the environment variables in the script itself because the cron job will have access to those given that they're in the script. And a few things that I did to clean that up, making sure that my script was executable in the system, moving it to user bin so that it's executable from anywhere and just shows as repo summary. And then I also moved my logging because I do want logging. Move that to var log, which on Linux systems is typically where programs will put their logs. I did have to change the permissions on the directory that I created within var log because it is a protected directory. So keep that in mind. My cron tab wasn't able to write to that directory right away because it needed permission to write to it. I'll include all of the information that you need to get started with that. And then of course, because we're layering on the complexity, so why not go all the way? I was looking at over-engineering this with containers. The goal was to maybe get like a plug and play experience so they could just run the container. The container, you could have a cron job running. And then when you don't want that thing to run anymore, you just shut down the container right? It would also make it easier potentially to export all of our environment variables from the host to container. And it would really centralize the dependency management. You, have, you wouldn't have to install all this stuff. It would just only be installed in the container. Docker files are so good for this. So why not try and containerize it? Yeah. So this ended up not being a good idea. And I realized that after I got it working, I mean, it was fun to explore. Okay. Don't judge me. It was not the right solution because the GitHub CLI requires a Git repo to run properly, right? But then even if you were to mount your Git repo as a volume in your container, there's like some weird ownership issue that you get. It's not that much benefit for like the amount of setup that it takes. Like it's easier to just not containerize it. So I didn't think there was a ton of value added there, but I did include the Docker file because I knew that some of you would be curious about it anyway. If you want, I can walk you through some of that. It's essentially all of the steps that I'd outlined before. I copy over the script. I make sure that that script is executable. I copy over my path and I install pop and mods as dependencies. I also install the GitHub CLI and I clean up the cache after each time that the container gets run. And I set the work directory to whatever repo it is that I want to follow. Whenever it starts up, it already knows what I want from it. I have it run the script when it starts as well. Given that Docker file, I have to do a few extra things when I run the Docker run command. I do have to provide some additional information to make it available at runtime. This includes one, making it an interactive terminal, two, mounting whatever repo it is that I wanna get the information from as a volume for the container, and then I also need to pass all of my environment variables as arguments. And then finally, I provide the image ID. And then I say, we're going to run repo summary and we're going to run it in the work directory, which is just like dot slash because that's that will be like the current directory once we're in the container. If you do want to challenge yourself a little bit, you can try getting a cron job set up in the Docker container if you're you know, real go-getter. Let us know what you think in the comments. Let us know if you try it out. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next video where we'll explore some other thing and over-engineer it and see how we go. Also, check out this video for like mods or pop or something. Okay, I'll put something cool in the corner here and you gotta click it.